Lynn Hiles Ministries presents Dr. Lynn Hiles, That You Might Have Life. And here's your host, Dr. Lynn Hiles. Thank you for joining us again this week on the program. I'm Dr. Lynn Hiles, and you are watching That You Might Have Life. We have been in a series uh, on the book of Judges for several weeks, and uh, much of the inspiration of what I've shared from the book of Judges really came from conversations that I had with my son uh, several years ago. And uh, he teaches a great deal from the book of Joshua and the book of Judges. And uh, uh, so uh, it really was, really came alive in my spirit last year. And I began to really dig into it and find some details that I thought were powerfully helpful to people. We started the series and we're kind of coming to the end of that. And I wanted to have my son on a little bit and uh, have a conversation with him. So it's a great pleasure to have on the show with me this week my oldest son, Jeremy, who is a minister in his own right, and uh, uh, I believe you'll be blessed by some of the things that he has to say. If you've been watching the program up to this week, I really highly, highly encourage you to go back and watch, especially the last two. Uh, we, we've been discussing a lot of stuff that has to do with even walking through some things. And I think we're in a season where people have been uh, in the valley, so to speak, and we've been talking about a little bit mental health and sometimes how people even in position struggle and people who are not in position struggle and crises of faith that we walk through. And uh, we really didn't set out to teach it like that, but it's really been, a, I think, a helpful series. If you'd like to go back and listen to them, uh, you can watch them on demand on our YouTube channel. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you can go back and watch them on demand on our YouTube channel. The easiest way to do that is to go to my website at lynnhiles.com, and that information is on the screen. In the upper right-hand corner, there is an icon that you can click that will take you right directly to my channel, and you can watch them on demand, or you can listen to the audio portions on our podcast, and there is an icon for that also at the same location as the YouTube, and then there's a Android uh, device there where you can click and listen to it on your Android. But I really encourage you to go back. What we've been sharing from the book of Judges is it starts out in verse number one by saying, now after the death of Joshua. And what we've been sharing is how that it is a powerful picture, knowing that the word Joshua is the Hebrew name Yeshua. The name Yeshua is the name of Jesus. So we've been applying uh, the book of Judges by saying, now after the death of Jesus, here are 12 judges. When after the death of Jesus in the New Covenant, there were 12 apostles. In the Old Testament, there were 12 judges, and each one of them executed a certain kind of judgment that was written. And if you remember when I was teaching this back some time ago from the book of Psalms, it says that this honor have all of his saints to execute the judgment written. And we made that not a negative thing, but knowing that there was a judgment in our favor that took place over 2,000 years ago and appropriating what was exacted in that judgment uh, is, I think, a powerful picture of what we can apply to our lives in the uh, finished work of Jesus Christ. And I want to start out this week again by kind of maybe continuing that a little bit because when I was thinking about... Uh, uh, Deborah and Jael, for instance, you know, there was a king that was, he was fl fleeing from, I believe his name was, uh, let me think if I can remember uh, the name of that king. But anyway, he was fleeing from uh, Israel's armies. Mm -hmm. And he came to the tent of Jael. And this king's name literally means, it talks about, you know, uh, a warfare going on in your mind. And uh, this king, you know, goes into her tent and she offers him milk to drink. He says, I'm thirsty. But instead of her giving him water, she gives him milk. Because we know that in the word of God, milk is the sincere milk of the word when you need to be exercised in the word of righteousness. So she gives him milk, first of all, yep. which I think is setting the stage to show, you know, show us that when we're in the middle of a battle in our minds, that we're still the righteousness of God in Christ. Yep. And the finished work still applies. And then she took the nail, which is the Hebrew word for nail. There's the same one she put right on the temple of that king. And she drove the peg through his head. And that to me speaks of taking the nail of the finished work of Jesus Christ and putting it in, in, 
into the high things that lift themselves against the knowledge of God and be able to pull down, you know, uh, every high thing that lifts itself against the knowledge of God. So it's really learning how to shift what we set our minds and affections on. So jump in there and whatever you want to, however you want to take it, we'll do it. It was, uh, I was thinking even before you mentioned them, I was thinking about Ehud and that Ehud had come to give tribute to this king and it said that he had left. Mm -hmm. And he comes to a place called, and I believe it was Gilgal, and he comes to a stone monument, the scripture says. And, you know, you were talking about how we apply the sincere milk of the word to some stuff and we apply uh, the death and burial of Jesus Christ, you know, to our minds. Sometimes when we're going through stuff, you know, our, our theme has been even just, you know, that, they, you know, we talked about, I believe, uh, the first week we were together about, you know, some the struggles of, of when you go through the valley stuff, you know, and some of those things are depression, mourning, uh, you know, different things that we talked about. We talked about, uh, I believe it was last week, we talked about even going, you know, um, the feelings of rejection that God, you know, we sometimes feel like, you know, our ministry or some things that we, we are, are not as good enough, you know, and that there's sometimes a rejection, but God brings those sometimes that are rejected. You know, we talked about Jephthah. But I was thinking about, you know, uh, we we're talking about applying the cross, applying the, the sincere milk of the word, but I was thinking about where Ehud came to the stone monument. And I believe that, if I'm correct, that stone monument was at the River Jordan. It's where they took the rocks out of the River Jordan, and they set them up, and he said, you know, this will be a memorial for you that when your children ask you one day what means these stones, you will tell them how God brought you over this Jordan. And I was thinking about, you know, when Ehud, Ehud went, and he paid tribute to the king because they, they were almost in a, uh, a bondage to this king, even though they were supposed to be possessing the land, instead of possessing, they were given tribute to this king to be able to keep their possessions. But I think when Ehud got to that stone monument, I think he saw something that day of a testimony. Mm -hmm. He said, you know what? God brought us across this Jordan to bring us into this land that's flowing with milk and honey. And he said he would drive out the inhabitants before you. And I think seeing that stone monument was almost, I, I see it like a testimony. Yeah. He saw a testimony of a victory. And a testimony of what Christ really wanted to do. And he turned, as the scripture says, he turned around, went back to that king, and he said, he shut the door and said, I've got a message for you. And it's a private message. And he shut the door and locked the doors. And that's when he began, you know, he slayed that king. And I think, you know, as we're talking about, I, you know, growing up in church, it seems like there was always a start, we would start church and we would ask, you know, was there any prayer requests? And whereas, you know, there's always a slew of prayer requests. But when we ask for testimonies, there's not always a lot of testimonies. You know, and I, when we were, when we were pastoring, that was one of the things we began to change. And I said, you know, I, I, I know you already have the prayer requests. And we care about the prayer requests, but we're going to save, we would save them for the end. We would want to start the church out on a, on where we would give testimonies. What has God done for you this week? What's some testimonies? And then we would preach the gospel from a place of victory so that by the time we got done to ask for prayer requests, there was already a stir up yeah. of faith to begin to go, you know, when I, I'm asking for this prayer, but now I have the faith that knows this God has taken care of this thing. Yeah. You know, and it began to change some of the atmosphere. So we began to have more testimonies than we did prayer requests because we were starting out in a place of victory. I think sometimes when we, you know, we, we all struggle with stuff and the struggle becomes so big that sometimes it makes it almost like it's bigger than God. When Ehud saw this king and he's given tribute to this king, it says that this king was a fat king. He said he was very fat. He was very fat. Did the Bible say you fat, you fat. <laughs> yeah. So he was very big, yeah. you know, and that, there, so this seemed like a big problem. Yeah. And the problem, because we were given tribute to it, was always getting fed. Yeah. And was always getting bigger. That's a good thought. And there was no victory that they could be seen over it until Ehud comes to the place that God said, I want you to set up these stones from the river Jordan so that one day when your kids ask what these stones mean, there is a testimony here to be saying to say, this is where God brought us over the river Jordan. This is where God began to bring us into a, the land that he promised. We ate from 
the old corn of this land, but we knew that we were going into a land that was flowing with milk and honey, that there was houses here that we did not build, vineyards here that we did not plant, and that this land was for us, and that God was going to drive the inhabitants out from us. I believe when he saw the testimony of those 12 stones, he had changed his mind. Just as we talk about, you know, when, when Deborah and, and when J.L. nails the nail to the head of that king, is that there is a change of the mindset of yep. that this thing looked big, it looked like a problem. Matter of fact, the guy that was supposed to be the judge, the Deborah is the prophetess in that scripture. And she yeah. says, you will not get the credit for this victory, but there is a, there's somebody else is going to get it. Yep. And it was a lowly woman in a tent that got the credit for the victory of that thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it was because she began to have a testimony of something that you apply what, what Christ has already done. She began to apply the testimony of who Jesus is, yeah. what Jesus has accomplished, the finished work of the cross becomes the testimony. Some, but I, I say that too to say there is an importance of our testimony as well. You know, when he said, when he came to that stone quarry, it's, you know, again, it's the stones that the, when they set them up, God said, this will be a testimony that one day your kids will ask, what means these stones? And you're going to be able to tell them what these stones mean. That, you know, la- I think last week we were together, we were talking about, you know, even the importance of family and how sometimes we have almost devalued the family and how, you know, like it's, it, you know, to be a stay at home parent or, you know, it's not, we don't see that as prestigious as, you know, something over something else and how prestigious sometimes that is because like you were preaching about, you know, if, you know, Mary raising Jesus and Joseph raising Jesus and could God trust you with his baby, but that is who God has entrusted. Our kids are the seed of Christ that he has entrusted us to. And sometimes hiring our testimony is very valuable Absolutely. to what our kids need to hear and how we have overcome some stuff or how God brought us through some stuff. Yep. What you know, uh, how God healed, you know, uh, hearing a testimony from somebody that said, you know what, I, I got healed of cancer. I got healed, you know, uh, I, we had an uncle that, that he, he was struggling, he got cancer in his brain. But we had had a man in our church that had the same thing, had an inoperable tumor, and they told him you're only going to have six months to live. This man, I believe, is as about five years, six years past that now, where we began, we just began to encourage them and tell them that's not what you know. We're going to believe, and we're going to. This is what God says about it. God wants to heal you and put them in the right mindset. God began to heal that man every time he goes back. The the, the doctor says tumor's gone. It's not there, and so we began to tell that testimony to our uncle when he was going through that stuff as a testimony to say, here's what you know. This isn't, God did this. Mm-hmm. We saw God do it. And so if he would do it there, we know he can do it again. I began to give that testimony because the testimony sometimes, to me, I think the testimony sometimes are more important Absolutely. than the prayer request. Yep, more so. Because sometimes, like I said, we keep feeding. What's the, not working. We keep feeding the fat king a tribute. Yeah. And it keeps getting, the, the, it seems like the, 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 the problem keeps getting bigger and That's bigger. Powerful. But sometimes we have to come back to the testimony and to the places that God sets up as, as as really places of faith, of monuments of faith to say, "This is look what I did here." Yeah, the big thing that you thought was big there, I took care of it, and look how I overcame this. Ways that we sometimes didn't think God could do. How did that ever become? Yeah, you know, how is God ever going to get this situation under control? How is God ever going to deliver us out of this? But then, when God does it, it just seems so easy. You know, you go well. You know, then when you're in the back into another problem, you think, "Well, this problem is bigger than that." But we need to keep going back to the testimonies yep. of things and giving people our testimony of, look what God has did. Look what the times God did heal me. Look what, at the times where God blessed us. Look at the times where God changed situations that seemed so bad, turned them to his good, that we almost think God gave the problem in the first place. When he didn't give the problem, he's just good at getting the problem solved. Yeah. You know. But sometimes it takes going back to those monuments of faith and seeing those faith so that, like I said, even for our kids, that when our kids ask, you know, what means these stones in your life? You can say, well, this is what God has done. These yeah. are the mighty things that God delivered and that even though the problem might seem big, it might be the thing that turns you around to that fat king and say, I've got, I've got a word from the Lord. Yeah. He is a deliverer. He's a healer. Began to declare again, you know, like you said, talking and about. He had, had a two edged sword, which is the word of God. So mm-hmm. he's standing on the word. Go ahead. Even JL, you know, applying the cross, the, the, the nail and the, yeah. and the milk to the kings. That, you know, again, even sometimes, you know, we were talking before we started here today and we were talking about, you know, even 
mental stuff we go through. Sometimes, you know, the mental things we go through as far as depressions or, you know, psychological things and just stuff we deal with and, you know, PTSD, whatever it is, sometimes those things can seem like such big problems that how do you overcome it? But I believe it's constantly coming back to the sincere milk of the word, applying what Jesus has did, that he is more than a conqueror, that he is able to, you know, we talk about the, 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 the bruising of Jesus. We talked about the bruising of Jesus and sometimes the, the, the crown of thorns. And every time Jesus bled, it was to heal us from something. His Absolutely. blood redeems us. His blood heals us. Sometimes the bruising are inward hurts that we yep. deal with. Yep. Or the crown of thorns on his head is sometimes a deal with what's happening pain. up here, the mental pain or the mental things we go through to bring some healing to those things that he is more than a conqueror in those things, you know. And like I said, we can look at the problem and go, well, it's, this seems so huge. And the problem just seems to get bigger, but sometimes we have to hear where somebody else got healed, how somebody else, or again, just hearing what Jesus did, how he did take the crown of the words on his back, how he did take the bruising to heal us of those things because your healing was so important to him that God would wrap himself in flesh and take the beating because he was so determined to heal you of some stuff. Yeah. Sometimes seeing those monuments of faith are the things that turn us around to the problem say, I'm not going to deal with this problem anymore. I'm not going to let it get bigger. I'm not going to let it get fatter. I'm not going to let it feed. I'm not going to give it any more tribute. Yeah. But I'm going to apply what Jesus did and watch. And sometimes when he, when he stuck that knife out, it said that he stuck it till the dirt came out. And that was just a fancy way, you know, the King James says for poop. Yeah. You know, there was some, there was some poop. Crap. There was some crap, crap yeah. in the game. Yeah. That need to be dealt with. Yeah. And it was, and that's what it was. Yeah. It was a bunch of crap. Yeah. And when we begin to really apply the testimony of what Jesus did and see, he is our victory. He has already brought us the victory over even sometimes the mental anguish, the, the different things with, that we deal with and begin to apply the nail to the head, apply the sincere milk of the word, begin to remind us of our testimonies and, and the monuments of faith. Sometimes what seems like it's big. And just keeps getting bigger is nothing but a load of crap. Yeah. And it's you know, and it really is dealt with easy when we begin to really apply who Christ is. It yeah. looks big. Yeah. I, I love that analogy of of paying tribute to it. Never thought of it quite like that. You know. Uh, you know the, the the scripture says concerning that king. I believe it was Eglon that he was a very fat man. And uh, so, you know, uh, we pay tribute to that and we keep on feeding into that. I was, I was reminded while you was talking about it when uh, one time I was uh, uh, at your father-in-law's church and uh, Galen and he, and he said, how many people have been healed? How many cancer survivors that we have here? And there must have been 20 people raised their hand. And, I, and I, that, that made an impact on me because I thought, boy, people need to see this. Yep. Because the many times that we see, well, someone passed away with the cancer, we think, well, just God never does heal any of that. And the fact of it, he does. You know, you know, we just talked about your uncle. And, of course, he's five years clean now. You know, if, uh, and he had not only a tumor on his brain, but in his lungs. And they didn't really give him a lot of shape. Two, two or three different kinds of cancer. But, he, you know, he's, he's, he's fine at this point. Yeah. You know, he just had his, uh, uh, you know, six-month checkup and no problems. And, and you have to say, you know, when you see that, people need to know that. Yep. You know, we say things like when we pray, like, Lord, if you do this, we'll not fail to thank and give you the praise. But we almost always fail to thank and give him our praise. You know, one of the things that my dad always did was he, you know, he shared his testimony. Your testimony is probably the most powerful thing you have. It is your monument of faith. It is your monument of faith. And, you know, he was healed of, uh, you know, they t he had sand dust and they took uh, uh, part of his lung off and he was on 37 different pills a day. But the Lord healed him, spoke to him when he got saved and healed him. And he just flushed off his medicine. Now, I'm not telling you to flush your medicine unless the Lord tells you to do that. But he, he felt like the Lord told him to do that. And every time he would go to a new doctor after that and they would take an x-ray, they would see a lung in there. And so they thought it was a growth. And they would go back through again and say, there's, you know, I thought you had surgery. He said, well, there's the scar. I had the surgery. Mm -hmm. But they said, there's something back in there. He said, it's a lung. The Lord healed me. Yeah. And they'd go back mm -hmm. in there. And sure enough, over and over again, they'd have to confirm the Lord put that top back on that lung. And so the Lord had healed him. 
And, uh, you know, he worked in the mines and he had some problems from that. And so the Lord healed him and he would start sharing that with people or he would start talking to people. I, I can remember he sat on a park bench sometimes. He'd always do something like that. He'd go someplace and just say, Lord, send somebody for me to witness to. And he'd talk about how God <laughs> brought him out of, of darkness, how yeah. God saved him, how the Lord brought him out of alcohol and and a life of uh, misery and that kind, you know, and all of the healing. And it would be something because people are looking for a God who's not just a theory. Yeah. He's a real, active, involved in your life God who is not this austere old man on a Victorian chair with a club in his hand, but he's a good father yeah. who's just like you. So even if your kids mess up, you might whoop them, but you're still going to make sure they're okay. And even I think the we think about says, God. Even like, the scripture yeah. saying, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we have magnified problems. We have magnified what's happening in the world. And we make it bigger than it is. Yeah. When what we really knew is need to magnify the Lord and really begin to declare how good he is, how great he is, the things that he has, and begin to declare the things that he has done. Because yeah. what that does is that it does, it builds up faith. I said this was a monument of faith that was set up. That, that Ehud saw that turned, that, that's the thing that turned him back around. Yeah. Matter of fact, when he, you know, when he, this king was so, so fat and so obese and full of stuff that when Ehud left, Ehud was able to escape and his guard, the, the king's guards never opened the door because they just figured, well, he's indisposed. He's on the bathroom. Yeah. Cause that's what he was, that's what yeah. it constantly was. It was yeah. just constantly. A lot of of, of junk yeah, he, coming out, of it. yeah, yeah, and so you know that, and that's I think we have magnified problems that are nothing but a bunch of junk, yeah, that keeps getting bigger and stink, yeah. When we really need to magnify the Lord, you know, I so even even in the stuff that happens in our world, we magnify it until we think it's bigger than it is, instead of magnifying yeah. the Lord and saying, you know what, all it takes is God encountering some 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 leaders. You know, some people that are in leadership and running countries, all it takes is for them to have an encounter with the Lord that begins to shift countries, begins to shift the things that are happening in, the, in this in this world. What if we begin to declare the gospel that gives an encounter for world leaders to have an encounter with yep. Jesus that begins to change their heart? Because the thing is, is that we can we can be mad about it all we want, or we can you know talk about how bad it is, but all it takes is an encounter. What if we begin to declare the goodness of God? In the land of the living, that might be cause uh, people to ha hear something, even world leaders to hear mm -hmm. something that gives them an encounter with Jesus that absolutely changes the whole direction of wars and rumors of wars and all those things and the things that we see in this world. I think it's so bad and it's so big. Instead of magnifying the problem, we begin to magnify the Lord with me. Talk about how good He is, how how He has really done great things, and that testimony of stuff might be the thing that an Ehud sees that turns him back to some stuff, or it might be the things that these kings see that begins to change their heart, and an encounter with Jesus begins to uh, change them. You know, like Pap's, Pap's uh, testimony was what God did in his life, how God delivered him, yeah. saved him, saved his whole family, the direct, and the whole direction of the house family changed because we were all destined for the same direction as Pap was. Yeah. But an encounter with the Holy Spirit is what changed the whole course of history for our family. How And God's still doing this with people all over the world. And as we think sometimes world leaders and things like that, like it's beyond that, but it's not. Mm -mm. You know, when God encounters, God encounters people on a daily basis. Yep. But sometimes it's our testimony and our declaration of who we are in Christ and what God has done in our lives. It might be the encounter that encounters world leaders that absolutely changes the course of history. Yep. And we can he did we it. can declare the bad stuff and yep. see history continue to repeat itself. Yep. And we can put the knives in some egg, king fat king eglon. Yep. And expose it for what it is and begin to change the course again instead of giving tribute. Yep. To the bad stuff in the world, we give honor to who what Christ does and what he has done and begins to change the course of history. Yep. Absolutely. Now I think about even like you know uh, the book of Daniel, the king had an encounter with God. You know, the Lord gives him a dream. Mm -hmm. And he's able to do that to world leaders today. And, you know, sometimes I think that we need to put ourselves on a fast from the news. I try to really limit the amount of news that I watch. And, and you know, one thing we've found out in the last several years is that depending on who's controlling the media, 
you know, one almost looks like a completely different story depending on which channel you're on. So mm -hmm. you can't really trust what you're seeing anyway. But, you know, even as I look and I, you think, well, the world is getting worse and worse and worse. I, I've been watching these documentaries recently. I watched about, uh, you know, uh, the, the civil war in this country and, uh, you know, had the privilege when I was in uh, Montana to go to Custer's last stand in the pastor's wife. There was a direct descendant of Crazy Horse. So we were able to see some things there. And when I started looking at the dates on this stuff, I'm thinking, I'm thinking that was a long, long time ago, and it's like a couple grandparents ago. Yep. And you start seeing how bad the world was then, the death and the killing and the issues that were there, and you start to see, wait a minute, you, we got this small tunnel vision of what's happening in my world right now, but we don't see how far we have come. Yep. And what you know, and I know, I know there's some very real problems in our world. I'm not trying to say that there's not. But I'm saying when you look at it and you say, well, you know, the world's getting worse and worse. Is it really? You know, because in my generation, man, polio has been eradicated. Smallpox, uh, you know, uh, the Black Plague, all kinds of diseases have have uh, gone. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you know, and what is amazing to me, though, is that good news doesn't sell. Yep. You know, in other words, you, 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 the bad news is the only thing that really gets attention. And people stay glued to that. And, I, you know, I talked with a news reporter one time. I actually wrote a book called Why, you think, uh, Why You've Been Duped Into Thinking the World is Getting Worse. And he said our whole uh, 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 idea when we got ready to air a story is if it bleeds, it leads. Because that shock therapy gets people glued back to the TV set. And then it becomes part of the conversation and part of the narrative. And I think what we need to do is shift gears and say, look what the Lord has done. Yep. I look back even at my own life and ministry, and you know we don't have a whole lot of time, but I remember what a huge step of faith it was. When I bought my first Telex One Plus One tape copy machine that would do one tape a minute, it was like $399 for a machine with 100 tapes. And that was a huge step of faith. And now I look and think, you know, we have sent out, tens of thousands of tapes and now then into CDs and then but at that moment it seemed like a big step but God was faithful and he'll be faithful to you well we're out of time if you would like to sow a seed into this ministry the easy way to do it is simply to go to the website the address is on the screen you can give through our PayPal portal with a debit card or credit card you can also send a check or money order to the address on the screen or you can call the number that'll come on the screen but do it today we need your help God bless you I am excited to announce the release of my latest book titled The Great I Am. In this book, we will explore the seven times in the Gospel of John that Jesus says, I am. When he uses that phrase, it is always in contrast to something from the Old Covenant. For instance, they thought Moses and the law was the door into the sheepfold, but Jesus said to them, I am the door. They thought that Israel was the true vine, but Jesus said to them, I am the vine, you are the branches. As you read the pages of this book, you will discover that Jesus removed the covenant of death and replaced it with the covenant of life. Get your copy of the book, The Great I Am, today.